Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our live virtual MDA My Senior Gravis Symposium. While we would have loved to have been in person for this event, we appreciate all of you joining us virtually today. My name is Nicole Petrowski, and I'm the Community Education Specialist for MDA, and we're so glad to have you here. MDA is committed to community education. We believe in the power of bringing our community together for opportunities to learn from specialists and having opportunities to connect with others. This event is part of a larger MDA Engage series and with disease specific symposia, community education seminars, and community webinars as well. Our community education seminars are geared towards general neuromuscular disease topics, such as best practices in care, research, and genetics. While each event will feature regional specialists covering those mentioned topics, each event will also feature a specialty topic, which you can view on the screen. I would recommend joining these seminars as each one will have a different information topic that may be well suited for you. To view the agendas for these seminars and to register, please visit MDA Engage section under the Family Seminars tab on MDA.org. We would not be able to put on educational programs without the support of our generous sponsors. I would like to thank Alexion, Argenix, Momenta, Immunivant and UCB for supporting this MG program. I would also like to thank the representatives who are in attendance today. Following the event, you will receive an email that will provide some additional education materials from MDA and our supporters, so be on the lookout for that email. Now I have just a few housekeeping items to go over before we begin our symposium today. As you can see, we have a lot lined up. We are recording today's event and we will be posting it to MDA.org's website for on-demand viewing in a few weeks and to ensure that those who weren't able to join us live today are able to access this information. For those of you joining the event live, please know all phone lines have been muted. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of each presentation, so please utilize the Q&A icon to type in your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, you will see a tray of webinar icons. Simply click on the Q&A icon to open up that feature and enter your question to host. You don't need to wait until the presentation is over either. You may submit while they are giving their presentation. So feel free to send those in. We also encourage participants to communicate with other participants by using the chat feature throughout the day. If you just want to say hi or let participants know where you are from or if you want to share a little bit of a story about you, please use the chat feature. Simply click on that chat icon at the bottom of your screen and make sure you're clicking to all panelists and attendees. That way all the attendees can see your comments. You will notice too that um, there are a few small breaks in between speakers, so feel free to stay connected to the live broadcast during these times. But this will also allow you to get um, time to get something to drink or grab something to eat real quick. And then just so you know, that is time that I am setting up audio for the following presenter. So you will hear us on our microphones. And then finally, um, at the end, I will be showing a QR code on our last slide, as well as emailing a brief survey at the end of our symposium. And we would like to receive your feedback on what you heard today. We want to make sure we're discussing topics that are of interest and that um, we use your feedback to make sure we are doing that. So thank you in advance for taking about five minutes to fill that out. And with that, I would like to begin our day and present some information on what MDA is about and what it is we actually do for the neuromuscular community. We are committed to transforming the lives of people affected by muscular dystrophy, ALS, and related neuromuscular diseases. We are able to honor this commitment by our work in two areas, through innovation and care via our 150 plus care centers, resources, ed education, and recreational programs, and also our innovations in science with a focus on research, therapies, and technology. And we have been doing this work for over 70 years. MDA is an umbrella organization supporting over 43 diseases in the neuromuscular disease space. No other nonprofit supports so many neuromuscular diseases. As an umbrella organization, we have the benefit of leveraging key learnings from one disease to inform others. And to learn more about these diseases under our umbrella, please visit mda.org under the About Neuromuscular Disease heading. 
The MDA has made significant investment in advancing the treatments for neuromuscular disease through our commitment to innovations in science. MDA is the largest source of funding for neuromuscular disease research outside the federal government, 1.4 billion since our inception. MDA research is directly linked to approved life-changing therapies across multiple neuromuscular diseases. When we developed a first and only data hub to aggregate healthcare, genetic and patient reported data and help accelerate further ba future breakthroughs. And this screen has quite a bit on there. And as you can see, um, with our inception about 70 years ago, we have done a lot of work. We are at a time of unprecedented change in the neuromuscular disease space with more treatments and development than ever before and rapid growth in understanding the mechanisms of neuromuscular disease and its treatment. As you can see, we currently have three active MG grants and we have committed more than 56 million in MG research since 1950. On this slide, you can see the progress that has happened in drug discovery over the past five years in the neuromuscular space. Treatments are now available for periodic paralysis, DMD, SMA, ALS, MG, and LEMS. MDA is proud to have provided funding to many of these treatments along the development process. MDA's Mover Data Hub is our neuromuscular observational research. Um, that's our short acronym, is improving the quality and ability of researchers and healthcare providers to enhance the care and management of individuals with living with neuromuscular disease. This is done by driving disease understanding, accelerating therapeutic development, and optimizing health outcomes. Mover collects clinical, genetic, and patient-reported data for multiple diseases to improve health outcomes and accelerate drug treatment. While Mycenae gravis is not yet included in this data hub, we are currently including seven, which includes DMD, ALS, BMD, LGMD, FSHD, Pompeii, and SMA. There are currently 31 care centers across the country participating in Mover, with 60 more working on steps toward participation. And since Mover is an observational registry, data is able to be collected via telemedicine, and phone visits with your neurologist, which is especially important during the pandemic where patient care has shifted immensely. And this helps us continue working towards our mover goals. If you should have questions about participating in a care center or have questions about the Mover Data Hub, you can email mdamover at mdausa.org. Now, let's look at MDA's innovation in care and we will start with our care center network. We have the largest network of care centers for neuromuscular disease, providing best-in-class comprehensive care. Our care centers ensure a multidisciplinary approach for patient care, which provides patients the opportunity to see multiple clinicians in one visit, allowing for comprehensive, coordinated care, and helping to reduce the number of trips required to take by a doctor. Our care network is made up of over 150 care centers, as I said before, at all different medical institutions. And we have over 2,000 providers working with families at these care centers. And currently about 12,000 individuals are participating in clinical trials. You don't have to navigate the neuromuscular disease journey alone. We are here to help. The MDA Resource Center is available to provide one-on-one -on -one support via phone or email for individuals and families looking for information about the disease covered under our umbrella. Our Resource Center is staffed by caring professionals, some who are living with neuromuscular disease themselves, so they offer a unique perspective and support to our MDA community. If you aren't currently visiting one of our MDA care centers and would like to, please reach out to our Resource Center for assistance. This resource center also provides information not only on our care center network, um, it also provides disease information, advocacy efforts, as well as our community programs and education events. The MDA race resource staff are available Monday through Friday, nine to five central time. Another great tool that is available at your fingertips is our clinical finder tool. This tool provides comprehensive lists of currently enrolling clinical trials in the neuromuscular disease space. The tool will walk you through some simple questions to direct you to the appropriate trials that meet the criteria that you shared. And you can locate this tool at mda.org slash clinical trials. 
MDA also has a myriad of patient and caregiver resources, which are available on MDA.org through contacting the Resource Center. These include our Quest magazine, which is mailed quarterly, multiple print and online resources, such as a caregiver's guide, teacher's guides, et cetera. And um, you can also be sure to stay connected with our blog titled Strongly. MDA is dedicated to advocating for national policies and programs that accelerate the development of therapies and cures, facilitating early diagnosis and treatment from day one, and ensuring access to critical support and promoting independence. Together with MDA's network of advocates, families, volunteers, and partners, we ensure that the collective voice of our community is heard. Some of the current advocacy initiatives include accessible air travel, newborn screening, access to genetic testing, patient-focused drug development meetings, increasing federal funding for research, and most recently added the MDA Advocacy Institute, which is an educational series featuring monthly webinars that provide advocates with grassroots skills, timely news on issues that are important to the neuromuscular community, and updates from Capitol Hill and federal agencies. To learn more about these additional initiatives or to join and become a grassroots advocate, please visit mda.org slash advocacy. And if you are older and online right now, you might remember our MDA telethon with Jerry Lewis. Well, we are very excited to relaunch the legendary MDA telethon with Kevin Hart joining as host. The telethon will be a two hour special airing globally on Saturday, October 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Hart will be joined by celebrity guests, including Jack Black, Usain Bolt, Josh Gad, Michael B. Jordan, Eva Longoria, Jillian Mercado, and more. Funds received from the telethon will support all the work MDA does for the 43 neuromuscular diseases under our umbrella. So to learn more about this big day, visit thetelethon.org. And with that, now I am pleased to turn over the presentation to our keynote presenter, Dr. Emmanuel Tiangson, who is a child neurologist at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and specializes in neuromuscular medicine. She has a special interest in treating periodic patients with myasthenia gravis and congenital myasthenic syndromes and runs CHLA's monthly multidisciplinary myasthenia clinic. Sorry. There have been um, there have made multidisciplinary care for MG standard of care for our, their patients, in addition to follow-ups and check-ins as needed. So Dr. Townsend, thank you for being here today. You could go ahead and share your screen and begin your presentation. Okay, sounds good. Let me get this ready. <clears throat> All right. Are you um, are you able to see my screen? Um, let yes. Me just yes. Okay. Great. So um, just like uh, Nicole said, um, I'm Dr. Tiangson. Um, I know a few of my patients are um, have heard about this and are on the talk. So hello and nice to see you virtually. Um, I am a pediatric neurologist in Los Angeles and I run the myasthenia clinic there. So let's get started. So um, the all, this is a this is going to be an overview of myasthenia, but pretty specific to pediatric myasthenia, um, since that's what I specialize in. So, just an overview: what is myasthenia gravis? And sometimes it's helpful to go back to the root. Um, the myasthenia itself means muscle weakness. Gravis means severe or grave. So, the term myasthenia gravis would mean muscle weakness that is grave and can be life threatening. It is a neuromuscular junction disorder. That means in a myasthenia patient, your muscles are normal. If we were to look at them under a microscope, same thing with the nerves, but the connection is not. It is also a, it is an autoimmune condition. Um, and the immune, I explained to patients, the immune system becomes overactive. And treatments that we do for myasthenia are aimed at controlling this overactive immune response. And so, a lot of the first presentations of myasthenia in crisis are triggered by infections or even by treating some other immune conditions, such as the new chemotherapeutic agents out there. Um, and if you have an autoimmune disease, that can increase your chances of having MG later in life or even at the same time, such as diabetes type 1, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, 
uh, thyroid disease, uh, which is auto, which can be autoimmune, as well, well as in, inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And so the this is just kind of another overview about um, involvement age ranges. There's a bimodal distribution, meaning that young people get it. So pediatric population, I have patients all the way um, that have been diagnosed at 11, 12 months of age, all the way up until 50 or 60 years of age when you're first diagnosed. Juvenile MG refers to patients under the age of 18. Ocular myasthenia can be the first presentation and is eyes only. Any other involvement other than the eyes is termed generalized, and that has a different treatment than ocular. Um, autoimmune attack is directed towards the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptor, and we'll get more into that later. MG, as you know, is characterized by fluctuating and fatigable weakness. And um, this significantly impairs daily function and activities of daily living, especially in kids. And treatment is tailored individually to each patient. So the initial presentation can be in crisis. Um, this could be as severe as needing to get intubated or have a tube in your throat for help with breathing. Or presentation can be subtle and mild, such as a droopy eyelid um, in the afternoon. Uh, in pediatric uh, myasthenia, thankfully, there's actually a higher rate of remission or minimal manifestation status, um, meaning very minimal symptoms controlled and very little medication. Um, the way that I select medications in children is very careful because there are side effects to all medications and we want to make sure that the kids can be kids. And so um, this is especially important if I'm diagnosing an infant with myasthenia, which does happen every once in a while. There are also a group of disorders called congenital myasthenic syndromes, which I'm not going to be expanding too much in this talk. Um, we're going to be talking mostly about the autoimmune version, but there are congenital myasthenic syndromes in which people are born with problems in the neuromuscular junction, and it's not an autoimmune disease. They're actually born like this and may have troubles breathing at the time of birth. And so there are lots of mutations that are in all parts of the neuromuscular junction. And this involves just treatment with things like mestinon or um, something called 3,4-DAP or FERDAPS, which is used for uh, Lambert-Eaton and other things, but not steroids or IVIG or any immune therapies. Uh, in pediatric myasthenia treatment, immune therapy is the mainstay of treatment. Symptom management, is for the congenital myasthenic syndromes as well as MG. Um, and then the reason I group them together and why I mentioned congenital myasthenic syndrome is because the multidisciplinary management and management of the fatigable symptoms is the same. And we have a clinic for myasthenia, both autoimmune and congenital and more. Okay, so when I the myasthenia, myasthenia patients in my clinic, how do I examine them? I've got toddlers all the way up until 21-year-olds. So how do you examine? And this is kind of the, the norm in pediatric medicine is observation, observation, observation. From this GIF, you could tell a lot about this patient already. And so if I'm trying to look for ptosis, I look for something that the kid is interested in. And these days, nowadays, it's a tablet, a cell phone, or sometimes a toy. And I use this object, if it's an iPad, to test the movements of the eyes. It'll so I'll move it around the room to see how their eyes move and how the eyelids are, are getting tired or not. Um, so if I'm not able to do that because their attention is not that good or they're very upset, then I can just test their eyelids at the beginning of the visit versus the end of the visit. What about the arms? Um, I can have them do high fives. I can have them pretend they're on a roller coaster. Um, I can do all sorts of things, uh, even if I can't ask them to cooperate with me and do it themselves. And then what about the legs? Um, so in one of our rooms, we do have the, the stairs. And so I could see babies and kids 
climb up and down the stairs, up and down the stairs over and over again and see how their hips and legs are doing. Um, and then whatever they're doing in the room while I'm talking to parents is fun to see as well. So these are just some examples of seeing how their legs are doing. And then the older patient, I can get them to do um, other fatigable exercise. And so I often have my patients do arm thrusts, kind of like this dance this girl is doing up at the top, as well as squats. So if I'm seeing eight patients in the morning, I'm doing 80 squats because I do 10 squats with them each. Um, other things we can do um, that adult patients on here are familiar with are the sustained up gaze, so looking up for 40 seconds, um, checking for double vision by looking to the side, to the to the sides and up and down um, and seeing if you see one or two, um, breathing tests, um, checking your voice, and then um, a good walk up and down the hallway and just asking you how you feel um, and kind of checking out what you're feeling. For laboratory monitoring, um, while anybody's on steroids, I check blood counts to see if you have any signs or symptoms of anemia or side effects of steroids because the steroids can actually bring your white count down because that's what they're supposed to do, but I'm not, I don't want them to go too low so that your immune system is totally compromised. Um, I look for a chemistry to check your liver function and your electrolytes because sometimes your liver function can be affected by steroids. And then um, vitamin D. Vitamin D is really important for bone health. And then as we're learning more about COVID, immune health. Uh, prednisone can actually bring down vitamin D levels and interfere with how it's absorbed in their body. So I check that to make sure we're supplementing it correctly. And um, in the acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients, um, I do track the antibodies or in the initial diagnosis, I do check these antibodies. I had a question recently is like, why did I only have one antibody checked first, but now you're checking all three? Um, the binding antibody, if you had to pick one, that would be the most specific one. So that's why sometimes you'll see just that one. But the other two can be important in some patients if they're not as, as uh, positive for the first. If you're seronegative, there are other antibodies to check, for example, musk antibody, LRP4. And then I saw in the chat earlier, um, Agrin is another one that is um, becoming more positive. Um, I also check antithyroid antibodies because those are often positive in patients who are termed seronegative. And um, tracking these antibodies over time, I find is helpful. And actually patients find helpful to have some sort of numerical value to track along how their immune progress is going. So if someone who was very positive before is tracking in the now negative or very negligible numbers, we can be more confident in weaning off that medication or lowering the dose. Um, we can also confirm remission or minimal manifestation status. Or a negative person may convert many years later. For example, I had a patient um, who was diagnosed before I, I saw her at age three and then at age 18 suddenly had, not suddenly, but after checking for many years, had positive antibodies. So this is a, a, a busy slide, but just know that for pediatric patients, um, a, all of our medicine is weight-based. In adults, it's a bit easier because there are standard doses um, in tablet form, but in pediatrics, oftentimes we are calculating this for a moving target, which is the weight and in a liquid form. For ocular myasthenia, usually I do um, mesinone alone. I don't plan on taking out the thymus um, and it's just mesinone without prednisone unless they're having more problems. If they are having more symptoms outside of the eyes, uh, for example, in the throat or in the body, then I talk about mesinone plus prednisone plus planning for a thymectomy at the same time, at the time of diagnosis or close to the time of diagnosis. Um, and then for the steroid dosing, I, I very much like to stay on the low side, um, starting at five or even lower milligrams a day. And then for pediatric patients, I, my comfortable maximum is maybe 10 to 15 milligrams daily. I've seen some adults go higher and I don't like going up that 
far before trying something else. Um, in kids, um, and as kids especially, the increased appetite and weight gain are an issue. Um, as, and um, having the increased facial roundness in those features are tough for kids who w are in school, um, as well as the behavioral and mood issues. And then in teenagers, the acne is a big problem. For generalized myasthenia, the reason I recommend thymectomy is because current medical literature and um, guidelines align with doing this um, very early, especially in kids. The reason is um, overall thymectomy improves your ability to give less medication or possibly no medication later. Um, I'm seeing this right now is that after one to two years is when you see the effect that wow, I'm doing a lot better on less medication. So it can take a while, but I be, feel that the, the benefit um, outweighs that initial very big shock, like I have to have a, a chest surgery. Um, I think it's, it's a discussion that we have, um, and you know, rightly so, right at the beginning. What if, so what if uh, mesinon and steroids together aren't effective? There are other medications to use um, that many people um, on this call are probably on. In, in the guidelines, adult myasthenia um, is usually treated with azathioprine. Um, personally, I don't use this in the pediatric population because of the side effect profile. Um, anecdotally, mycophenolate or Celsept um, can be used, um, though I don't use this in, in kids um, that are younger than like teenage age or close to teenage age. And in the girls, I have to counsel them to be on birth control pills at the same time, uh, just because it does have very significant and severe side uh, birth defects associated with it. To avoid the high steroid uh, regimens, I do go to IVIG. I have used plasma exchange or PLEX as it's abbreviated in the hospital setting. Echolizumab or Solaris as the trade name is known is not yet approved for um, pediatric myasthenia. Um, but I am actually in, a, um, in an expanded access program or, or through clinical trial, we're trying to get this to pediatric patients to get it approved. Um, rituximab is used for refractory cases. Um, which I have used in a few of my patients because we've kind of exhausted the other things. And it's first line if you're musk positive. Okay. And so um, in, I, in pediatrics, uh, or in adult myasthenia, when I looked at the guidelines, um, they don't advocate for the use of chronic IVIG. But in pediatrics, I find that this is actually something that I'm using uh, frequently, um, because I don't want to expose these growing kids to high dose chronic steroids, because steroids can stunt growth, affect behavior, and self esteem in these kids in an important time. Um, if I'm using something like a, a chemotherapeutic agent, of which azathioprine and Celsept are, I also have to be aware of those side effects in growing children. Uh, the teenage population, I could be a little bit more um, uh, like treating them a little bit more like adults. Um, and I start IVIG after an adequate trial of mesinon and steroids together, at least three to four months. And so in pediatrics, again, it's weight-based, but in this case, adult cases are weight-based as well. It's the, the dose is two grams per kilogram of weight. And so if you needed to, to know like the metric conversion for kilograms, um, kilograms, if you take your kilogram weight, you multiply it by 2.2, there's your pounds. So if you want to feel like you're lighter, just look at your weight in kilograms, it's lower. Um, and so I usually divide this over two days and um, people can get these now, especially in the time of COVID-19 via home infusion services, which I'm converting most of my patients to, so they don't have to go to the hospital where there could potentially be um, an exposure risk. 
If they're inpatient, I would divide it over more days just to give them less of a protein load. And uh, I tell patients to be patient. It may not happen on the first IVIG infusion. It may take a, a few infusions uh, to many infusions to see a good uh, upward trend in the fatigability symptoms. And so I started every four weeks, so once a month, and then try it for a few cycles to see how it's going. Um, if someone's doing well, I'll space it to six weeks. If they're doing even better at the next visit, eight weeks. And if they're doing better than that, 10 weeks or even discontinuing IVIG, or if they're not doing so well, going down um, uh, to a frequency of every three weeks or every two weeks, for example. So it's, um, it's a very personalized treatment to see how long it lasts in, in someone's body and everybody's body is different. And so these are common questions that I, that I um, have people uh, answer for me during each of the visits. Do you feel it wearing off? Do you feel a difference when you get it? Do you feel normal before and after? Or do you not feel normal before and after? Um, and eventually my goal for every myasthenia patients that I see is to have them feel normal and possibly discontinue infusions if I can, because it does cut into your day and activities. Um, but if it's benefiting quality of life, and even if patients age out of my clinic at age 21 and still want to continue it through college or through um, the transition over to another adult provider, um, they will ask for it to be continued even if it is happening every 10 weeks, for example. And so this is just a uh, this is just a, uh, a summary of what I went over. Um, echolizumab is available for adult patients over the age of 18, but I'm limited in the 17 and under group in that I can't use it yet. And social considerations for the infusions, um, I try to make them as infrequent as possible and try to make it as convenient as possible. Um, this used to be more of a problem when infusions were only available in the hospital. Uh, and then for activities, um, there are accommodations at school to help these kids take breaks for both academic and physical activities at school. Um, even now in COVID um, times, for online classes, I'm asking for kids to be able to take breaks for being in front of the computer because this tires out their eyes. And then, um, there is a risk of depression and social isolation, and there are a lot of great services that the MDA and the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation have, and connecting the patients to these resources are very important. So um, as Nicole mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, there are multidisciplinary clinics that we have made for the pediatric myasthenia patients. We have an annual evaluation with functional testing in addition to the regular visits they have with me in um, neurology clinic. And so the team includes um, the neuromuscular specialist doctor, which would be me or my colleague. Um, we have a nurse care manager, physical and occupational therapist, a registered dietitian, a social worker. And um, when we had the in-person um, MDA representative, it was very helpful to have them there to connect them to the larger community. And so this um, will just kind of go, I just like to go over how our clinic works. So for me, as the neuromuscular specialist, I'll go through the initial consultation and diagnosis in usually a separate clinic before they come to our multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary clinic. Um, I'll do the follow-up in our visit make sure that we do all of the annual evaluations that are needed, such as the functional tests and making sure that we get all their monitoring labs on time. I coordinate the rest of the team and I co uh, carry out the recommendations and do, their do the long care follow-up of the patients. This is a picture of my nurse, Arlene. She's our neuromuscular nurse case manager. She keeps a running list and database of all of our myasthenia patients. She's schedules and make sure that everyone gets a yearly visit in our multidisciplinary clinic. And uh, we have a very intricate schedule that I have a, a picture of um, that 
schedules all of us within a morning. So eight providers go in and out of a room from 7 to 12, um, 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then we do follow up for medical uh, equipment, therapies, medications, and infusions. And she follows up to make sure that everything is covered for insurance and authorizations are, are placed. We have a physical therapist. This is one of my physical therapists, Eunice. Um, she evaluates uh, the walking abilities, lower extremity strength and range of motion. Um, if a brace is needed for stretching needs or uh, wheelchair evaluations are needed, she'll help with that. Uh, there are also time functional testings we can do to check progress year over year, which is the six minute walk test and 10 meter run, which is also used in research. And then um, what's important for our pediatric patients is teaching them how to manage their fatigue and make sure that they conserve their energy throughout the day, um, which is tough for four year olds, for example, but it can be done in the older patients. This is my um, occupational therapist, Jed. Um, he helps with evaluating bul uh, what we call bulbar function, which is throat function, swallowing function, um, and facial functions. Um, he does swallowing tests and interpretations, as well as upper extremity function and ability to do your normal daily activities. Um, he can recommend equipment. He can also help with the fat like fatigue uh, management. And then if braces are needed, um, he, can he can do um, evaluations and recommendations for that. He also does, um, as you may have seen these surveys before, the MGADL um, activities of daily living and MGQOL quality of life questionnaires. This is Ume, my registered dietitian. She does um, annual measurements and uh, weight checks for our kids over time, especially while they're on steroids and counseling on appropriate diet and exercise habits. Um, she's very nice and the, the kids and parents actually respond very well to her because having a healthy weight is very important for managing fatigue and muscle strength. Um, we also have the opposite problem in our clinic sometimes in which we have underweight or undernourished patients. This is my social worker, Lori. Um, it is very important for, um, for these kids to have counseling services if they need it, because this is a very difficult um, condition to, to manage, especially when you're very young. Um, and also to make sure that appropriate accommodations are, are available at school. Um, she gives counseling on school resources, mental health resources, and home resources, especially during this time where finances may not be the most secure. And then also checking in on the mental health of the family. Um, this, uh, well, this is Melissa. Um, she, she was our MDA rep. Now she's in a, um, in a, in a uh, promoted role within the MDA, but she used to come and have our patients register for the MDA, tell them about camp, um, and then tell them about all the other resources that are available to them as, as far as information on their diagnosis, um, even talking to someone who's not in our medical team and then awareness of the MG-specific events, such as today's event. And so um, I'm associated with MDA for today's, uh, um, for today's event, but also the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America, the MGFA, is also a very great resource. And this is an example of a very recent clinic back in August. Um, we have the patient and then all of us have 30 minutes with the patient to do our assessments. Then we have a team meeting at the end to coordinate care, make sure that the patient's getting everything that they need. Um, so COVID-19, there are actually um, papers about guidance of treatment of myasthenia patients during this time. And so I tell my patients to assume that they have some immune risk um, and some increased risk for um, COVID infection if they're on immune suppression therapy, such as prednisone, steroids. Um, the recommendation though is to not stop any existing medication. There's no evidence that the, the therapy with mesonon only increases your risk of infection that the prednisone may. Um, the, it, 
the recommendation is to switch to home infusion if you're currently getting any hospital infusions, consider. Um, though our hospital um, is, of course, putting in all of the uh, infectious protocols and making sure our patients are safe. There's really no evidence if you're on Ecolizumab, for example, that complement inhibitors increase the risk of a COVID-19 infection since it works by a different pathway. So um, consider seriously before starting a, a therapy such as rituximab because you're depleting the, the B cells needed for antibody production. If you're already on it, um, it's still counseled to continue it because then you'd have to start all over again. Blood monitoring coming in for labs can be spaced out. If you're getting vaccines, consider using the inactive ones instead of the live ones. But for the pediatric patients, I do still advocate getting the flu vaccine, for example. And then for school, if remote learning is an option, I highly recommend it. There are um, a potential for myasthenic crisis if you do get sick with COVID. Um, so standard protocol to wear a mask, wash your hands and everything, especially for my senior patients. There may be a recommendation to pause rituximab if there is a concern about it, um, but to continue things like mycophenolate or prednisone or azathioprine to make sure that you're not redosing things. And so this is a case-by-case -case basis in a discussion that I have with everyone in clinic. So um, I don't feel all that special for treating pediatric uh, myasthenia because I do see kids who, to me, seem like adults or are adults because I see 18 to 21-year-olds as well. And so um, I can transition pretty confidently from the pediatric to the adult world because there are a lot of really great adult neurologists out there who are very familiar with myasthenia and its care. And so in, in pediatric myasthenia, the special things, um, special considerations in summary, um, I have to take into account a lot about the side effect profile for kids especially and their growth. Um, I do use a lot more IVIG possibly than my adult colleagues just because I have to take into account the side effects of those stronger medications and infusions. I don't push the steroid dosing too high because of the effects on growth and their health. Um, and uh, thankfully, um, I do see a lot of remission or at least improvement in symptoms in my population, um, especially with a thymectomy. And so I do talk about the thymectomy very strongly nowadays. And my goal is to make these kids feel as normal as possible and they really like it when they do feel normal. And then these are just some further reading. Um, uh, should these uh, slides, I think these slides and this presentation will become available, but there are um, guidelines and consensus um, for myasthenia gravis. And these just are a few of the ones that I did look um, on, and these are references. And here's my team. This is this is actually last Halloween, so I think this is like a timely a timely uh, picture. Um, this is our team together during one of our last um, multidisciplinary clinics. And so, in addition to the multidisciplinary team, we have a lot of help from our nursing staff and our medical assistant and uh, financial staff. And thank you for listening. And that's my presentation there. I muted. Thank you very much. Yeah. We did get some questions that have come. I did. Yeah, I saw all of these come up and I didn't know whether I was supposed to answer them um, so, as I was going, but I decided to kind of just leave the end part for the questions yeah. to kind of see if there are similar ones that I could answer at once. So I know you spoke very highly of the thymectomy um, and this person's asking, do you have any agrin only patients and do you recommend thymectomy for severe MG? Um, so I don't have um, agrin only patients right now. Um, I mean, uh, actually, to to be frank and honest, I haven't been checking for it. Um, so I think I will be checking for that more. Actually, the seronegative panel doesn't currently include agrin. It's only LRP4 and musk. So I think as far as panels go, um, it would be helpful to have those as like a panel to send. Um, for severe myasthenia, I would 
look to thymectomy as a possible thing, especially if other treatments have not been working, um, because it kind of goes to the source of the problem, which is an overactive immune system. Uh, the reason for thymectomy, so I don't know if, um, just as a general thing, the thymus is what establishes your immune system when you're a baby. So when you're a baby, your thymus is huge because it's it's establishing your immune system throughout your body. And then when you're an older kid or adult, it actually involutes and you're not supposed to have much of a thymus anymore. So um, the reason we get that MRI beforehand is to see where your thymus is and if it's big and what big, how big the target is to take it out. Very interesting. Um, this person said they had ocular MG as a child and when it when they were 12, it spread to the legs, at 16, spread to the arm, and at 17, it spread to the rest of the body. Is that common? That is very common. Um, so it will, it can start as eyes only. Um, within the first several years of your diagnosis, it may spread to other parts of the body. And at that point, it's called, it's a generalized form of myasthenia. Okay. My son is negative for ACHR, MUSK, and LRP4. What other antibody tests besides Agrin would you recommend? He was diagnosed at seven and he's now 15. He's had thymectomy and is on Vestavon. Yeah, so um, if, if, uh, if the, the usual tests are negative, um, then I actually, um, I, I have checked the thyroid antibodies just to have an antibody to track. So anti-TPO, which stands for anti-thyroperoxidase, I've actually had that come up positive in some of my patients. Um, so it is showing that there is an autoimmune response going on, though it's not specific to myasthenia. Is it common to be misdiagnosed in, um, in a child? Is Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, myasthenia can be misdiagnosed as a number of things. Um, I've had um, babies um, in the, the babies who were diagnosed diagnosed with other problems, and I'm like, wait, this can be this can be treated. So um, it's very important to diagnose myasthenia because it's one of the treatable neuromuscular conditions. Do you recommend someone with MG low immune systems not to go back to work due to COVID? Um, if you have that option. So um, I have written doctor's notes to uh, people going to high school for the first time. And I'm like, well, it's a completely new environment to you. If you have the remote option to work, I would say take the remote option just because you do have the immune compromised state. And, and um, we have someone here that's asking to, what is the process to attend your clinic if they live out of state? Is that even possible? Um, I think uh, we have had uh, out of state patients come, but you have to physically come okay. to our clinic. Um, the, no, telemedicine. Um, no telemedicine for that, just because, um, just so you're aware for telemedicine, um, for everybody on the call, um, our medical licenses are only good in our state. Okay. So if, yeah. yeah, so so if you physically come to our clinic, yes, we can do a consultation um, uh, officially, but um, if it's telehealth, then we can only give kind of general advice, but not anything specific for you. So if you need to come to CHLA, the the information is actually on our website, um, and you can even look up um, our neurology clinic and multidisciplinary clinic to start the referral process to come see us. Perfect. I'm just going through the chat to make sure I didn't miss anything. It's oh, yeah. There's a lot that happened, guys. I know. A lot of people are yeah. talking, which is wonderful. I know. This is, a great, this is a great conversation. It's nice to be able to access some different communication when you're at home and find out yeah. what's going on with others. Um, we just had a question um, typed in, comma pred to adult MG, how rare or common is, oh, compared, sorry. <laughs> compared to adult MG, how rare or common is pediatric MG? Um, I mean, to me, to me, it's quite common because they are um, filtered into my clinic. Um, I feel that pediatric MG is actually common um, in that, um, 
because it has a bimodal, bimodal distribution means that it kind of avoids all the people in the middle. So it's, it's like the, the young people all the way down to babies and then the older people. So I see it quite a bit. Okay. I do not see any more questions that have come yeah. in. And I was looking, I just want to make sure. I'm yeah, I'm looking at the, at the chat and it looks like there are a very wide range of um, ages and medication regimens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, which Does is, anything it's really out? great to see you. Um, so I have, yeah, so people are on uh, combinations of all the medications that, mm -hmm. um, that we went through. Um, 3,4 DAP um, is not currently, I don't think FERDAPS is currently FDA approved for MG use. Um, there was a clinical trial for the congenital myasthenic syndrome patients, pediatric patients. Um, so I don't commonly prescribe 3,4 DAP, but it does help with the neuromuscular junction by a different pathway. Um, okay, great. Yeah. Is there a minimum age for starting a trial of Solaris typically? And if so, when is it appropriate? Right. So Solaris is only approved for 18 and older right now. Okay. Um, I'm about to try to start it in an 11 year old for um, my research study to get it approved for pediatrics. Okay, very interesting. Well, I am not seeing anything pop in. So I um, thank you very much for your time. This was a great discussion and thank you everybody yeah. for being so active. Oh, hold on, we have one more. Oh, this person's just commenting. IVIG oh, is not, IVIG. Federally, not federally approved for MG. I'm on one day a month and my doctor's been fighting for two. Oh my goodness. Um, um, in California, at least, our, our state insurance, California Children's Service of IVIG for myasthenia. So I haven't had pushback in California, at least. Okay. So um, I wish you the best in trying to get that approved because it is actually one of the first line medications or uh, infusions for, especially for crisis, if you're in the hospital. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And we will see you in a little bit for the um, drug panel discussion. Yes. Yes.